Uh, I, I did something before service. I, uh, I hope. Where, where's my guy at? Where's Joe at? Uh, I, I, uh, I don't even know if he's in here. Right? Joe got raptured. We're all in trouble. <laughs> I got a whole lot to rethink about the way <laughs> that I'm doing life. Um, uh, I asked them to do something that is just completely unrelated to anything that I have to share tonight. Uh, but I am a dad, and I am now a dad of five, and this is our little Elijah Gabriel. Um, he is two weeks old today, so mom and Elijah are home doing well. Uh, he was eight pounds, four ounces. All right, my wife is a rock star. <laughs> um, eight pounds, four ounces. He was born on April 6th, though he is two weeks old today. Um, we are completely in love with him, excited about what God will do with him. And we are very sober that we have birthed an Elijah into our moment of history. That the Lord has put an Elijah in our house, and he is readying him for this generation. Um, there's, there's a lot about the process of pregnancy that really mirrors a lot of the way that God does even what he does in our own lives. Um, can I just encourage maybe somebody tonight who's carrying a dream from the Lord? Right? I've been now through the process and watched my wife. Again, this is number five. All right? So we have four others, uh, 11, 9, 6, 2, and two weeks old. Um, so two girls, three boys. I actually have a Josiah, an Isaiah, and an Elijah. Yeah, let's get it. Um, but it is, as I've, as I've watched the process and journeyed, right, through the process of pregnancy now, obviously not myself, but watching my wife and, and obviously being very intimately involved, um, I, I've noticed, right, that there's a moment whenever conception takes place, when the announcement that you're carrying a dream that God has for you becomes very real to you. Um, there's a deposit that's made, right? There's a sense of impartation, there's a crossing over that happens from where everything up until that moment, now after that announcement, things can no longer remain the same. Because you realize now you're carrying a new dream. You're carrying the thought or the sense of something that God has a desire of that you just haven't yet actually been brought to the point where you can give birth to the thing that God has revealed to you. But you're carrying it. And you know that it's real. But as we've all probably realized, um, different unique moments and intersections of revelation, uh, what they do is they put us into process. They put you into process. Um, and, and in that process, there are many stages and phases to that process. Right, Because in the beginning, there's the announcement, and there's real excitement, and we want to tell everybody, and we want to rally the troops so that people can celebrate with us because we're carrying something that God has revealed. And then you actually have to start carrying that in process. Right? And, and, and uh, there, are, there are different ways, I guess, that characterize the different trimesters, as, it, as it's called in pregnancy. Right? In the first trimester, I, I saw my wife, she was really tired. Right, like the same energy that was involved in the celebrating the announcement was not necessarily there every day for those first 13 weeks as she was walking that out. Um, but then, then there was a point of transition where she started to notice that it was no longer just in idea but that there was actually real life on the inside. And it was starting to flutter and to kick because what had been announced was beginning to develop. There was something that was actually forming, and it was growing on the inside. You see, there are, there are stages according to the dream that God has given you. 
And if we don't understand the process or the journey according to revelation or insight or destiny related matters, then at times we can complicate or compromise our own desire in order to see us deliver what it is that God has revealed. And then you you begin to notice that there's new life on the inside. And it's forming and it's growing. And things begin to get uncomfortable. Certain things don't fit the same way they used to. Because you are growing because of what is building on the inside of you. Right? You, you are growing. You are developing. You are recognizing increase in your own life because God's dream is increasing on the inside. And certain things don't fit the way that they used to, but they're not intended to. You see, in growth and development, at times we are to grow out of certain things that don't fit our season. Right? Paul said, when I was a child, man, I just did childish stuff. It was cool. But when I became a man... Right? I had to transition well. I had to put certain things behind me because of my own growth, because of my own transformation, because of the way that God was bringing increase to the stature of his desires that he had for me. And what I noticed is that in the final stages before it was the second announcement, because the second announcement is not, hey, you're carrying life, but the second announcement is, hey, listen, man, it's go time. Right? Like, like. It's time to go to the hospital, right? But leading up to that moment, what I noticed is that things got really uncomfortable. My wife wasn't able to rest well, right? She she had a lot of sleepless nights because of the growing discomfort that what had been growing on the inside of her was now soon dawning the day because it wasn't supposed to remain on the inside forever, But it was supposed to be carried well and stewarded right and watched over and prayed over and tarried with and interceded on behalf of. But there came a moment where the growing restlessness and discomfort, you see, because it had gotten so large that it was no longer able to live on the inside. And that what God had asked her to carry on the inside, the moment of transition was coming. Because it was coming time for it to actually be birthed and find its placement on the outside. And then the moment came where the pains began to set in. And it was very real to my wife that it was coming close and that we were going to have to set our attention on going to the hospital. And I noticed that it was in the final stages before actually birthing what had been deposited into my wife's womb. It increased the pressure. It increased the pain. It involved tears. It involved having to give an intense attention. Everything else that could have occupied a space in her attention in that final moment or season, if you would, leading into the birthing of what it is that God had entrusted to her womb. When it came time to birth it, it involved the most pressure. It was the most intense moments of the entire process. It involved a lot of travailing. It involved weeping. Uh, You see, I, I want to encourage you tonight that you may find yourself in certain places along the way. But if you can recognize the seasons or the stages, you can partner with God in your process and not compromise to give an early delivery because of desires that are not yet ready for the moment where what God has been building on the inside of you is actually ready to be trusted with life on the outside of you. Because the dream tarries, but God is not a man that he would lie. And though it speaks of an appointed time, wait for it, because God is not a man that he would lie. I want to encourage those of you that are carrying a dream. Find rest in the season of your dream and be beautiful in season. Right? That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, right? There's a time and a season for every activity under the heavens. Be beautiful in season. 
But in order to be beautiful in season, you have to discern your season. Right? A proper discerning of your season gives you the ability to be beautiful in your season. Right? Be beautiful. Don't create beauty. Be beautiful. You can attempt to create beauty in a bunch of ways that are going to satisfy an event or a result orientation. Um, but you can be beautiful by discerning your season and finding a restful confidence that the same God who began a good work in you will see it through into completion. And that what you are carrying, when it comes full term, he'll birth it. He'll deliver it into the world. He is readying something in you so that it can live on the outside of you, but there's a process to its growth and development on the inside. And you may find yourself in the final moments, and these are the toughest moments of the whole journey because they involve a lot of pressure. They involve an intense attention upon what the Lord has said and a, an eliminating of other things that are not assisting in the birthing or the delivering of what it is that God has said to you and the thing that he has revealed to you. Um, discern your season. Uh, that actually has nothing to do with what I want to talk about. But uh, more than anything, I just wanted to show you my little guy. <laughs> um, open up your Bibles to John 13. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and just pray. Uh, I just... As I was praying this afternoon, I, I, I saw myself encouraging you with that, and so I, I hope um, that that lands somewhere. You can open up to John 13. Uh, we will not begin there, but we will arrive there. Now, there may be some points along the way where you completely think that I've forgotten about John 13. Uh, I have not. I'll just say that in the beginning so that we can track together. We are going to make it to John 13. All right, Pastor Dominic told me I had until midnight. I am ready to rock. I came fully loaded. <laughs> Tell you everything I know about the Bible. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Um, let's pray. Um, Jesus, we love you. And we don't say that lightly because we don't take you lightly. Um, we love you, Lord. You as a real person. You as a faithful friend. You as a savior and Lord. You as the king enthroned in our hearts. Um, we sense you now in the room, King Jesus. And we pray that you would um, just capture our attention and that you would help us, Lord, by the end of the evening to be able to see you in a real way, for this is what you desire. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to do what you love to do. Unveil the beauty of this bridegroom king to our hearts. No distractions, no buffers, no insulation tonight. We want raw and intense proximity to the person and the presence of Jesus. Help us tonight to be changed forever. Lord, do in us what we could never do. And even if we could find a way to do it, it wouldn't be as real as if you did it in us. So do it in us tonight, Lord. Do it in us tonight, Lord. Whatever you desire. Thank you for our expectation. But we know that you are always thinking so much more than we are on our behalf. Um, we love you with all of our hearts, and you are king, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. For the next couple of moments, uh, I, I would like to, I, I guess, just have a conversation or talk to you about this incredible revolution that God has launched in our generation. Not just in our generation, but it actually spans over every generation that is behind us. And it will continue for as many generations that will be in front of us because God is on a mission. He is on a mission, and I am so grateful. My heart was touched so deeply with the songs that we sang tonight. Um, 
Wherever they went, uh, again, more people got raptured. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for singing to Jesus. Oh, there you are. Thank you for singing to the Lord and for making him central in the place of worship. God is on a mission, and his mission is to ready a people to be with, to marry, and to enjoy his son forever. It's this marriage supper of the lamb moment where those of us that are included in that bride of Christ conversation, where we will have what it is that our hearts currently immediately burn for right now in the fullness that we desire, that we realize will not be fully realized until that great day. But our hearts burn with great jealousy right here, right now, because we want Jesus. The Holy Ghost has made the person of Jesus very real to us and revealed the person of Jesus to our hearts individually in a way that has been sufficient enough in order for us to lay down all of our life. God has launched a revolution throughout the nations of the world, a revolution of the redeemed. Those of us that are redeemed, those of us that have pledged our allegiance to Jesus, those of us that are a new creation. God is repopulating the nations with a new version of humanity. For if any man be in Christ, that man is a new creature. He is a new creation. He is a new version of human. Paul tells us that the gospel is not good or bad. It doesn't really matter to me how good of a person you thought you were. It doesn't matter to me how bad of a person you thought you were. Because the gospel is not good or bad. Ephesians 2 tells us the gospel is dead or alive. And some of us may have thought currently up until this moment that we were already a great person and then we just added Jesus to our life. I, I can't tell you how far from the truth that actually is. Paul says that at one point in our life we were all bound. Prisoners subjected to the tyranny of the powers of the air. That's everybody. There's no exemption in that. Everybody. At one point, everybody fit into this conversation. Dead in our trespasses, satisfied in our sin, the depravity of the human soul and the corruption because of the consequences of sin had completely saturated us through and through to the point where we didn't even know any different than the embodiment and the enjoyment of sin. But praise God that while we were yet sinners... Christ came and died for those of us that were ungodly. We were rebels. We were hostile to God. We were enemies in our own mind. We were distant. We were independent. And some of us were thoroughly satisfied. But God has launched a revolution. And he has unleashed humble, powerful, broken, meek, confident servants into the nations. And he is fulfilling his mission in this moment of history in and through the lives of those of us who have seen Jesus, right? I, I didn't get born again because somebody played my favorite song. I didn't get born again because somebody criticized my sinful way of life. I didn't get born again because somebody debated me well enough to prove that hell was real and that's where I was headed. I got born again because God loved me well in the way that he revealed himself to me. Paul said, I was the chief of sinners. This is a man, a zealous Pharisee, a religious man, a man who thought for his entire life he had aligned himself with the way that God desired. And that was until he actually saw him. You see, you can think whatever you want to think about your way of life until you actually see him. Right? This was Paul's response in Acts 9. He said, who are you? He's running 100 miles an hour. 
Man, he's jailing Christians. He's killing and authorizing the murdering of people in ministry. I mean, okay. And he's 100 miles an hour on the road to Damascus. And all of a sudden, his high horse, 100 miles an hour, doing his thing, his way, fully confident, zealous, powerful, influential, bright light. Voice from heaven, thrown down, a revealing of the Son of Man. And he says, who are you? Th this is baffling. This is a man who thought he knew God his whole life. He says, who are you, Lord? And the second question is the byproduct of God himself answering the first question. The first question is, who are you? And God answers or he satisfies that request with a revelation of himself. And the second question is equally as important. He says, what do you want me to do about that? W what am I actually supposed to do about that now? You see, because revelation creates disruptions. Revelation requires a rearranging. He says, I thought I knew who you were, but then you came to me. I had my own ideas about you, but then you revealed yourself to me. I was doing my own thing. I was satisfied. I was confident. I was living in an assurance that the way that I was on was the right way. And then all of a sudden, you intersected with me somewhere and showed me who it is that you actually are. And now, I just can't keep living like I haven't seen what I've seen. I just can't keep doing what it was that I was doing. You see, I, now I know too much. I've seen too much. Now I have revelation, and revelation has created a complication. Because now, even if I wanted to, I can't be satisfied with my old way of life. Because you have revealed yourself to me. Now, even if I wanted to, there's no satisfaction in where I used to be. I can try to play the part. I can try to associate myself again. I can try to baptize myself once again into my old ways and practices, but it just doesn't have the same sting to it. Paul says, man, like, who are you? I thought I knew you. Right? Isn't that just how beautiful Jesus is? In every moment, in every season of life where you think you've cornered the market on who Jesus is, right, where you think you've seen everything there is to see, where you think you've been as far as there is to go, right, like, oh, okay, Lord, like, cool, you healed somebody, like, oh, yeah, I've, I've seen you heal people, that's cool. Oh, I know you as the healer. Oh, yeah, you delivered somebody again. Oh, isn't that nice? Like, oh, yeah, but I know you as the deliverer. I, I need to see something else. <laughs> and then he comes again. And he knows how to come super close. And you see, this is, this is where Paul was. Paul experienced something in God that he had never experienced. He saw something he had never seen. Man, may the Lord do that for our hearts tonight. May he show you something you've never seen. May he take you somewhere you've never been. May he bring you deeper and higher and farther than you ever thought was even available um, you see, and out of this experience, Paul says, what do you want me to do? Because my whole life is ruined now. Like, I can't keep doing what I was doing. Like, you understand, this is very problematic. Like, like this is an issue. Like, what am I actually supposed to do now? Like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow... And I can't give myself to the things that I've been giving myself to. Like, this has created an issue. Like, this is a situation that must be dealt with. You see, but the beauty of Paul's request reveals the authenticity of his encounter. The beauty of his request is I've actually seen you for myself. I got born again because the Lord came to me. And he revealed himself to me. And he revealed himself to me in a way 
where I realized that he was the pearl of great price. He revealed himself to me in a way where I understood immediately that he was the only thing in this life that was worth living for. That all of the other vain pursuits, all of the other hollow conversations, all of the other worldly ambitions, all of the lustful desires and the attractive things, all of the glistening lights and all of the substances and all of the other things that the world and its systems and structures has to offer, I understood immediately in the moment when he loved me by revealing himself to me that he was all that I wanted. And the Lord is raising up a people in this moment, in this hour, uh, because I, I don't think at times we stop to understand the implications of the moment of history that we are standing in. We are crossing over and into what I believe is the setup for the end of days where there is a global escalation that is happening in the moment that we are living in. There is an increase, there is a rise of demonic desire, there's an unleashing of corruption, and it's going to continue to escalate. We understand that the end time tragedy or the end time situation when the man of lawlessness will be fully revealed, right? This is all Bible, by the way, right? I'm not like Debbie Downer, you know what I mean? Like this is all Bible, Right? Like, we, we, we want to know the Bible so that we can discern our seasons. Right? The sons of Issachar discerned times and seasons, not just so that they could be impressive with revelatory insights, but so that they could posture themselves to know what to do because of the season that they were in. And we are drawing nigh towards what we know is going to be the moment where God employs people for that end time harvest. The greatest revival that will hit all of the nations of the world. Why does it have to hit all of the nations of the world? Because God longs for a people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, even nations that you don't like. Right? Even nations that we would prefer not to see get saved. Even people that we think are wicked and bankrupt and corrupt. God's going to save them too. But the world is being set up right now for what we realize as to the beginning of the end of days. We are drawing close to this revelation moment, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where what it is that our hearts burn for most, which is to be with Jesus, which is to be with Jesus, right? You can have all the world, just give me Jesus. With what our hearts burn for most, we're going to get it. Because he is not a man that he would lie. And he is going to come for us. But before he comes for us, because we're living in the tension of his first coming, where he secured all of the promises, and his second coming, where all of those will be fully realized in the way that God ultimately desires. And so we're living in a moment of great tension. But in this moment of tension, God is on mission. And God is on mission to bring the revelation of his son to all creation. This is God's mission. There is a purpose that is ultimate. Right? There are a lot of things that we can give our lives to that are immediate. But let me just encourage you with this. Anything that you are giving your life to that is immediate should line up with what God is most interested that is ultimate. There are a lot of distractions There are a lot of pits and ruts along the way, but God has a desire that is ultimate. And his desire that is ultimate is that there be an unveiling of the beauty of his son as king to the nations of the world. And this is his mission. This is what the power of his spirit is doing that crosses over the globe. Because God longs for a people. And he has launched or inaugurated this revolution of the redeemed. Because God is populating the nations with a new version of humanity. And that's you and that's me. Now now hear me when I say a new version of humanity. What I don't mean 
is worldly people that are religious and have just adopted a Jesus-loving lifestyle. Right? I, I'm not talking about a people who love the world and know how to sing church songs. I'm not talking about a people who are fully immersed, not just by way of attraction, but by way of satisfaction to the world and its systems and all of its offerings. But I'm talking about a people that have actually been transformed in their nature. Where now the way you live is natural because you have a new nature. Where we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of God's son. Right? This is his desire is to repopulate the nations of the world with a people that look like and live like Jesus. And that requires an actual transformation and not just a transfer of information. Um, this takes more than a TED talk, right? Th this takes more than a podcast. It takes more than a YouTube video, right? It takes more than a Facebook profit, right? Like you need, you need a whole lot more than that to actually drill into the nature of a man or a woman and transform them on a gut level, on a default level, where your natural instincts and responses at a default level have been reprogrammed. But this is what God is doing in those that have given their lives to Jesus. For if any man be in Christ, not just around Christ, not just at the right church gathering, not just faithful at conference hopping and events and things, but any man that is in Christ, that man is a new creature. And God has provided all of the tools necessary in order to accomplish the task that seems like mission impossible. How can you actually change a man from the inside out? Right? We realize the bankruptcy of the human condition. We realize the lust, the perversion, the, the, the inhumane desires at times. We realize all of the saturation of the soul with the tyranny and the consequences of sin. Right? I, I've been in a moment with God in a beautiful season where I have been renewed in my gratitude that I am not what it is that I used to be. That I'm not trying to fake it till I make it. I just don't have the Jesus t-shirt on and know how to post all the right memes. But like Paul says, I am what I am and what I am has been accomplished by the grace of God. That I'm not what I used to be. That God has actually done something by way of real work and transformation to not just change what people see on the outside. But the reason that what they see on the outside is different is because God has reprogrammed all of the guts on the inside. My desires have changed. My appetites are different. The things that I long to give my attention and my affection to, it's different. It's not the same. And I've been renewed in my gratitude for the real work of conforming me to the image of his son that he has been committed to, even in moments and times and seasons where I knew good and well, I did not deserve for God to be long-suffering with me the way that he was. But he stayed to it, and he kept working, and he loved me, and he loved me well. And the way that he loved me was by continually revealing himself to me. I, I think we need to pause for a moment for what it is that I just said. The way that God loves you is by revealing himself to you. Because you need to understand that God is sovereign. That God is the most powerful being in the universe and extended into the furthest parts of the cosmos. That God is sovereign. He is the most high. He is Yahweh. 
He is king of kings, lord of lords. He is enthroned above not just worldly rulers, but above powers, above principalities, above all of the lowercase g gods. He is enthroned above it all. Uh, in, in actuality, it's super funny. You would know no reason to call yourself the most high if there was nobody else. Had the rulers of the age known what they were doing, when they nailed Jesus to the cross, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. God is sovereign. He is sovereign. And what that means in a simple way is he is in governmental control of all creation. He is ruling creation. And he is using time as one of his tools to fulfill his purpose. And he is right now on mission, personally, in our hearts, to love us well by continuing to reveal himself to us. Because God knows that the best thing that can happen to us is for us to see him. You, you, you really have to understand, this isn't in some arrogant, self-centered, like, oh, man, God's into himself. No, it's not that way at all. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. Jesus in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, right, all you that want rest, all of you that are overburdened, right, you're tired, you're weary, you're taxed, you're just, you're done with trying to do it your own way, come to me, I'll give you rest. Come to me. Right, not answers, solutions, breakthrough, strategy, provision. Come to me. I'm better than all those things anyways. C come to me. That, that won't actually give you rest. It may temporarily satisfy your desire for rest, but those things won't actually give you rest. Come to me. Right, that's 1128. But then 29 is mind-boggling. He says, come and learn from me because I'm gentle. And if that wasn't enough, and I'm humble. What? Th that'd be like somebody, I won't use myself as the example, Th that'd be like somebody come up and taking the mic and being like, everybody, come learn from me. I'm super humble. <laughs> I, 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 I am. I'm super humble. You would think to yourself, like, what? Like, I mean, are you serious? But we have to understand that God is super humble. That he is meek, he is lowly. Brokenness is a power source. The meek shall inherit the earth. Right, I've heard it said best, because the meek one rules the heavens. Come to me and learn from me, because I'm humble. And this isn't some self-inflated, arrogant Right, self depiction where he can establish a premise for like a resume building in the minds of others. No, he actually is this, and he in fact is the only person in the whole universe that can say this without it being tainted by those other things. Come to me, I'm humble. And the best thing that you could do is actually see me, and in seeing me, begin to learn from me. That would be the best thing that you could actually do. And I realize that I am serving you best and loving you well by giving you continual opportunities for me to reveal myself to you. Because I'm humble. I'm humble. And my desire for you to worship me is not because I need it. It's not because it changes me. Right? We, we do understand God is unchanged by our worship. That that may sound a little complicated or a little confrontational. He is what he is. He has always been it. He will always be it. He will never change. He is unchanging. He is eternal. He is forever. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who is and was and is to come. He is not changed by our worship. So his invitation for you and I to worship is not because he needs these moments where his insecurity gets satisfied. Well, I'm just going to find a big throne. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to demand all you earthly creatures to fill in the voids and the lack 
that I have. Um, God has no lacks. He has no voids. But in fact, God is so humble that he is the only being in the universe that uses all power and authority to serve those that he loves, to exalt them, to transform them, to create space in order to renew them through the revealing of himself to them. It's not God that gets changed whenever we come to worship. It's us that get changed when we come to worship. God invites us to come and worship him, to behold him, and to see him enthroned above everything else. And as he gives us a revelation of himself, he understands that it's not doing anything in or for him where he is lacking, but it is actually doing everything in and for us where we are lacking. That in worshiping him, we're the ones that are changed. In worshiping him, we're the ones that are transformed. In seeing him and beholding him, we are becoming more like him. And he understands that the best thing that could happen to us is for him to reveal himself to us. And God is on a mission to reveal his son to the nations of the world. And he is doing it in and through the lives of those who carry the revelation of Jesus. We are being conformed into his image so that we can be ready to be with him forever. But until we are going to be with him forever, we are readying the nations for his coming again. And we are partnering with God's purpose throughout the nations of the world to bring the revelation of Jesus to every space and place where people may be because God longs to love them well. And one of the ways that he is going to love them is by providing them the opportunity to see his son as king over everything and to repent and to align their life with what he calls the way. It is a proper response to the gospel. It is what Paul says. Now that I have seen you, what am I supposed to do about it? Because I've actually seen him. And I don't want my life to be the same. I've actually seen him. And I've chosen to give him everything. Because he's given me everything. I don't want a little bit of Jesus in my life. I want to give him my whole life because he's opened up his life and he's invited me in to something that I did not deserve. And now I have access and I have fellowship and I have communion and I have deep intimacy with Jesus as a real person. And everything about me over time is or at least should be changing. And now... I'm actually carrying a revelation of Jesus that I'm not trying to systematically manufacture by my own strength. Because something happens to you when you get close to him. And something happens to you when he gets close to you. Moses goes up the mountain in Exodus And it says, this has always been a beautiful passage to me. In Exodus 34, it says that while he's up there, something happens to him. It says that through his getting close to God and interacting with him in a very intense way, by way of proximity. Right? We want to live in intense proximity to the presence of God. Man, do whatever you must in order to protect the presence in your life. And Moses is living in intense proximity to the presence of God. And while he's there, it says that his face literally catches on fire. That there's a glow. There's a shine. There's a radiance that now sits on the countenance of Moses. And what I love is that it says that he did not even know what had happened to him until others around him when he came back down told him because of how afraid they were of what was actually happening to him. You see, we understand, like, Moses didn't go to the top of the mount so that he could get, like, the face glow anointing. You know what I mean? So that he could launch, like, his face glow meetings 
You know what I mean? Like he could take this show on the road. Like I got a little bit of shine and now I'm ready to get it on. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, this wasn't what Moses was after. He was after God. And as he was after the Lord, things started to happen to him that he was not even aware of. He wasn't trying to work it up. He wasn't trying to make it happen. There wasn't some fleshly manufacturing. It wasn't some just trying to fake it till you make it. But he put himself in intense proximity to the presence and the person of God. And as a byproduct, something began to change. And it reflected and it was radiant out of his own countenance. Um, because you can't fake what's on your face. Jesus said, when your eye is single, your whole body will be filled with light. And that there will be a glow, there will be an illumination, there will be a radiance about you that sets you apart. You'll be different. You'll be in it, but you'll be separate from it. You won't be of it. right? You'll be in the midst of it, but you won't be the same. There, there's something about you that shines. There's a glow about you. There's a burn that you carry. There's something different in your countenance. I can see it on your face. You carry the Lord in your face. And every time I see you, I feel like deeply in your eyes, like I can see him looking out of you at me. God is fulfilling this mission by launching laborers into the nations that carry the revelation of Jesus. Who are willing to serve brothers and betrayers even unto the point of death. <laughs> um, let us be very careful <laughs> uh, how excited we get because the implications of where we are going uh, will land very heavily upon our doorstep. God is launching laborers into the nations that are willing to love brother and betrayer, even unto the point of death. Because the way that God wields power is by serving those that he loves. Is by bringing them the revelation of himself, even unto the end of himself. Jesus' final moments while he's on the cross before he's about to cross over into the place of death. Right? We just celebrated resurrection. We're in the season of Passover. Praise God that the covenant son allowed death to pass onto him rather than passing over him. Right? The plagues of Israel hit the firstborn of all of those in Egypt. Death passed over the Israelites and now literally we know that death has been canceled for the believer in Jesus because death did not only pass over their houses and their firstborn, but while the blood of the lamb has been applied to our lives, death that was supposed to pass on to us has been abolished forever. Oh, death, where is your sting? Jesus allowed death to pass on to him so that now death would pass over those of us that have given our lives to him. Death is not even a way that you can stop believers in Jesus. But we understand that even in his final moments on the cross, Jesus is interceding for those that are crucifying him because he's longing to give a revelation of himself to even those that are against him, to those that resist him. I mean, what we understand is that by way of God being sovereign, he is working all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called by his name and according to his purposes, right? He's working all things together for good, right? God has a sovereign wisdom that is governing all of creation. And at times, what he is doing is beyond our comprehension because we are in a moment that is immediate and God is thinking of something that is ultimate, and he is weaving generations together in a beautiful mosaic that at the end of the age will glorify him in and through things that we didn't understand, things that we didn't even agree with, times and moments and seasons where the pain or the pressure or the resistance or the wrestling and the tension with powers and principalities where things didn't seem to be going our way. He is even leveraging all of the energy of the enemy to fulfill his purposes. <laughs> He's leveraging even the energy of the enemy to fulfill his purposes. For even the enemy's efforts become a tool that ultimately God will be glorified in because it will serve the fulfillment of what it is that God desires. 
right? You want to crucify Jesus, right? This is God's wisdom. Had they known what they were doing when they nailed Jesus to the cross, then they never would have actually crucified the Lord of glory. You want to crucify the Lord of glory right when it seems like the devil has the upper hand, right when it seems like the enemy has God pinned down, right when it seems like he's going to nail God to the cross and he's finally going to get his way and he's going to derail and bring compromise and put an end to everything that God desires. I've cornered you. I have you. And then God in his own beautiful wisdom uses all of the ways that the enemy advances, seeming to, advances against him. He turns it all over and uses all of the enemy's effort as a tool in order to fulfill the purposes that he has. <laughs> um, God is working all things together for good to those that love him, to those that are called according to his name, and to those who have actually been aligned or have been employed to serve his purposes. And in John 13, ta-da! <laughs> we find a beautiful situation where the servant son, right, the suffering servant, the pattern son, what would it look like to serve God's purposes in the nations of the earth? I believe that John 13 gives us a beautiful depiction of what it is that God desires as he is launching this revolution of the redeemed across the globe, partnering by the power of his spirit to fulfill the purpose that he is on, that he is using time in order to fulfill. What would it look like? I believe that Jesus shows us. When you open up John 13, it tells us that Jesus knew that his time was coming to an end. That, that's an important frame in which the rest of the substance of the chapter is going to fit in. He knew that his time was coming to an end. It was the night before he was going to be betrayed. It was the eve of Passover, we understand. It says, and the de that, that was verse 1 in John 13. Verse 2, and the devil already having put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus... So we understand that Jesus is not just with brothers, but that there's a betrayer in the mix. Verse 3, it says that he knew where he came from. Right? Verse 1 also says that he loved all of those that he knew God gave him, and he loved them until the end. Even in verse 2, right, the devil betraying Jesus through the person of Judas. Verse 3, he knew where he came from. He knew that his father had given him all authority, and he knew that he was soon going back to his father. And it says, because he understood these things, that he got up from the table, that he unclothed or unrobed himself, and that he put on the garments of a servant. Right? He put on the garments of a servant, and he began to wash the feet of those that were with him. I, I have to ask myself, because God is so not like me. And praise God that he's not like me. Um, there'd probably be a lot of people that don't exist anymore if I had the power that God has. <laughs> that random person in traffic... <laughs> But, but it makes me ask the question, who are you, Lord? Because Isaiah 55 tells us that his ways are not our ways and that his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. What is a man who has all power and authority? Right? Let, let, like, let's listen to this. Jesus understands that he came from his father, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He understands that he came from his father, and that his father gave him all power and authority, right? No man takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. For the father has given me power to lay my life down and power to pick it back up. Um, we, we understand that he has all power. 
power and authority. That it's the night before he is entering into the process that would ultimately bring him to the end of his earthly days in this way. This was a unique moment. Jesus was a man, Colossians 1, filled with the Spirit of God. It was God's desire and his delight to put the fullness of who he was in Christ as a man. We understand this is a unique moment in the life of Jesus in this way. What is he doing in the final moments of his life? Washing feet. Like, what? Like, bro, have you lost your mind? I've got a foot thing anyways. Like, I'm not, I'm not crazy about feet. I, I mean, that, that's a separate conversation, but like, I, I'm not really into feet anyways. I mean, if you are, if that's your thing, man, praise God for you. But what is he doing? The final moments of his life. The final moments where he could be out doing anything. But he is locked up in close proximity to those that he longs to reveal himself to. And he's giving them a revelation that is going to have to sustain them whenever they arise from the opportunity to see him this way. Because Jesus told them plainly before, worldly rulers have a way of wielding power whenever it's given to them. Don't be like them. Don't lord it over people. Don't use it for your advantage. Don't be self-absorbed and self-serving. He said, I did not teach you that way. And he's locked up in a room. It's his final moments. And he unrobes himself. And as a servant, he begins to wash feet. And I thought to myself, this is not what I would be doing. Bro, if I had like 24 hours to live, I'm not going to find 12 dudes whose feet I can wash. (laughs) I mean, who are you, Lord? Because we are clearly not thinking the same way. (laughs) But we have to understand that Jesus is secure. It says he knows where he came from. He knows that he has all power. And he knows where he's going. This is called security. He's secure, which means he's not insecure. Right? That there's no ounce or element of insecurity in him in order to bring compromise to what God longs to do with him. I delight to do your will. I find my greatest satisfaction. I come alive in yielding to your desires. Do with me as you will. I long to honor you. I long to see all of your dreams realized. Here I am. You've given me all power, but I am going to use all of that power to lay down all of the potential things that I could be doing because I long to do the thing that you want me doing. That This is called real security. I know that I'm yours. I know you've given me power. I know that one day I'm coming back to you. And so here I am, Lord, use me as you will. Right? Jesus is secure, which means he's not insecure. (laughs) And because he understands who he is, right? This is called identity. He's secure in his being. He has security in his identity. This is super important. He has security in his identity. And because he has security in his identity, he does not see his assignment as an assault on who he is. (laughs) Because he is secure and he is not insecure. You see, whenever we are insecure or whenever there are elements of insecurity that are alive within us, we will see an assignment as an assault on our identity. And you will be offended whenever the invitation towards certain tasks, 
Whenever the invitation unto certain responsibilities, whenever the invitation or the moment presents itself and the door swings wide open and God's desires become real to you or revealed to you, you will see an invitation or an assignment. But if it does not align with who you want people to think you are, oh boy, he is secure which means that he can do anything because there is no thing that is going to change the thing that he knows he already is. There is no task. There is no work. There is no responsibility. I can serve in any capacity. I can do anything that you want me to. Take me to the highest place or to the lowest place. What did Jesus say? You want to be greater than John? Find a place lower than John if you want to be great. Those that are the greatest among you should be the servants of all. Jesus understands I'm not insecure, so I don't have to shield my life from responsibilities that don't align with who I think I want to be. Because when we're insecure, <laughs> when we're insecure, um, we are quick to take up things that feed what it is that we desire people to think about us. find yourself saying, I've graduated from stuff like that. I don't do that type of stuff anymore. I pay people to do that stuff now. I don't serve that way. Are you crazy? I don't, no, that, that's not me anymore. No, give that to somebody who's new. <laughs> right, give, give that to somebody who, who, who doesn't have the time in this that I do. Right, that's why they were offended, at least at the end of the day. Whenever the master came to issue payment for all of those who had been laboring, what did they say? They say, you're going to give them the same thing you gave me? Like, bro, I've been in this all day long. They showed up in the last 30 minutes. What do you mean we're going to get paid the same? But because Jesus is not given to insecurity, his assignment is not an assault on his identity. His assignment is not an assault on his identity. He can do anything because he's free from all of the things that would bind him or make him a prisoner to only be able to see the value in certain opportunities or assignments. It doesn't matter to me the thing that you reveal to me anymore because assignments come and go and seasons shift and change. It doesn't matter to me if I'm in a moment or a season where I'm on the highest place because seasons can change and you'll invite me to the lowest place. But if I have insecurity that's alive in me, I won't know how to actually apprehend what it is that we prayed out earlier from Philippians 4. I've learned the secret. That's what Paul says. I've learned the secret. I'm not speaking to you out of want because I've had time where there was little, where there was nothing, where I was living and I was desiring. But then I've also had moments and seasons where I had it all and there was great abundance. He said, but I've learned the secret. I found the radical middle. It's Christ in me. What does that mean? That means my devotion no longer demands a certain context to thrive. Oh, man. My devotion no longer demands a certain context in order for me to be faithful to God. It doesn't matter to me where you put me. It doesn't matter to me the way that life looks for me. I don't require a certain income level, a certain social status, right? I don't require a certain type of car, a certain size house. I don't require certain opportunities. I don't require a certain position or title. I don't require the microphone. None of this actually puts a demand on my devotion because I've learned the secret. It's Christ in me that is the hope of glory. And Jesus is present. And because he is free from insecurity, he is free to do anything that God may ask of him. Let me ask you this. Are you free to do anything that the Lord wants from you? Are you free? Are you free? Well, sure, depending on what that means, I guess. Right? Like, I mean, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. 
Oh, Jesus, I'll do anything you want me to do. We'll accept that. No, no, no. Here I am, Lord. I bind you, devil. I didn't think God would actually say that. I didn't think he would actually take me at my word. <laughs> um, Jesus is free. He's free to do anything his father asks him because he understands the thing that his father has made him. You see, and when you understand what you are, what you do doesn't necessarily matter that much anymore. Or it shouldn't. Because time is but a breath. It is but a vapor. It is here today. It is gone tomorrow. Our life in an immediate sense, we are so captivated and at times a prisoner to the bubble of immediacy where so much of what we long to do, we are living for the results and the applauds of the world around us rather than understanding that there is a day before us where we are going to be rewarded and not necessarily to how many likes or follows or subscribers, not necessarily to how many views, not necessarily to how many people came, not necessarily to how much of a conversation got created about you. None of those things are going to determine the way that you get rewarded when Whenever we actually see him when he comes for us, you will be rewarded to the degree that you surrendered. You will be rewarded to the degree that you surrendered. You will be rewarded to the degree that you surrendered. I delight to do your will. This is what you long for me to do in the final moments of my life. You want me to take the lowest place? You want me to serve both brother and betrayer? Right? I mean, at least, like, give me the dudes that, like, I like. You know what I'm saying? Like, but man, you're going to give me the guy that, like, has been accusing me and backstabbing me? He's been plotting on me? Like, you're going to give me the guy that, like, he's had it out for me the whole time, and yet you've still had me keep him close? Right? Jesus had a meal with his betrayer on the night before he was put into his process. Right? When was the last time you had a meal with your Judas? <laughs> He's like, no, nah, brother, that's not God's wisdom. <laughs> that, that, that can't be God. Right? It was for Jesus. But he's not like us. And that's the whole point, is that he wants to make us like him. And the only way that we can become like him is to see him and to see what he's like. And in his likeness, we are continually being transformed. We are being taken away from what we used to be, right? This is the journeying that we would call transformation, the conforming us to the image of Jesus. Um, that we have justification, but this would be a journeying uh, of sanctification of sorts, but also confirmation, right? Making us more like him in our actual nature to where we're not trying to be like Jesus anymore, right? That's exhausting. A and it's not a lot of fun. Because it's very difficult to keep up for long periods of time. <clears throat> you are much better off falling hopelessly bankrupt into the presence of God and realizing in desperation and an authentic desire, Lord, there are certain things that are just not as real as I would like them to be in me, and I am going to linger as long as it takes in order for you to touch me, in order for you to change me, in order for you to transform me, in order for you to take what right now is alive on the inside of me that is resisting you, that wants to reject you, that honestly does not want to be like you, because there are ways that you are calling me to walk this thing out that I don't have delight and I don't have joy and I don't have rest. And it is going to take you doing something in me so that I can be more like you. And Jesus is there. And again, his assignment is not an assault on his identity. But I understand. 
Lord, you can ask me to do whatever you want me to do because I know who I am. In, in brokenness, I have confidence. Right? In meekness and lowliness, I understand that those who humble themselves before the mighty hand of God, that he will lift them up, he will exalt them. Right? It, it's, it's the contradiction. Right? Those who want to be first, you should be last. <laughs> Right? But when you choose to be last, he turns it all around and you end up being first. You can ask me to do whatever you want me to do. Because I understand that there are going to be unique assignments that you are going to invite me into in order for me to partner with your desires to reveal your son to the nations of the earth, but also that starts right here socially, locally, to those who are within my immediate sphere of influence, right? When we hear nations, we have to also think neighbors, <laughs> right? We want neighbors and nations, right? And so you are going to invite me in unique ways to bear who you are and the revealing of your son to those that are around me because you are longing to love them well by revealing yourself to them. Because it's in the opportunity of revelation that we find the opportunity to repent and align ourselves with God and his mission until Jesus comes. And this is the most compassionate thing that you could do. I'm going to read for you the definition of compassion. Right? Words are important to me. Compassion is defined... Right, this is the Compassion Conference. Compassion is defined as a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune. But it is equally accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. <laughs> it is a feeling of deep sympathy or sorrow. Man, when you look around and you see the brokenness, when you see how the condition of sin has so saturated our society, when you see people that are bound, when you see people that are dead in their trespasses, when you realize that there was a moment where my life too fit into that conversation, where had it not been for the Lord, and his desire for me to be changed, had it not been for the Lord who came to me when I didn't deserve it, had it not been for the Lord who revealed himself to me and gave me the opportunity to step out of who I used to be and into the freedom that is found in Jesus, had it not been for God himself and his compassion towards me, that while I was living in misfortune, while I was living in suffering, because the greatest suffering is the tyranny and the prison cell of sin, knowing that we are headed towards destruction with no hope of transformation, that I am a slave and there's nothing that I can do to free myself or rid my life of the taskmaster, feeling like everything that I am ever going to do is just more of the same. This is slavery. This is misfortune. This is suffering at its greatest. But it is accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate that pain, to alleviate that sorrow. The greatest way that you could serve the world around you through compassion is to bring the revelation of Jesus to where it is that people right now are living, right now where people are broken, right now where people are living, thinking they're distant from God, thinking that they're enemies of his, thinking that he wants nothing to do with them. One of the greatest ways that you could serve them is by bringing the announcement of the gospel and revealing the beauty of Jesus as king, his love for them, his death for them, his resurrection for them, them, his ascension for them, his coming again for them, and while there is still time, of offer people the opportunity, while there is still time, offer people the opportunity 
This is the most compassionate thing that we could do for the suffering that has come upon the world. Offer them the opportunity to give their life to Jesus and serve them. Serve both brother and betrayer, even unto the point of death. What does Jesus say towards the end of John 13? He says, love one another as I have loved you. Right? So you don't even get to define love anymore. He defines love by the way that he reveals himself to you and by the way that he continues to love you by revealing himself to you. As I have loved you, now love one another. And when you do this, all of the world will know that you are my disciples. In John 17, when you do this, all of the world will know that you belong to me, that I am who I say I am, and that the Father has sent me into the world. We need a real work of God's Spirit in us to make us what we are not so that he can do with us what we honestly at times don't want to do. Because it's so much easier to live in a self-serving way. It's so much easier to try to leverage what God is doing, even in my own life, towards things that I want it to be pointed at. It's so much easier to live in a way that is self-absorbed, that is self-centered. And as a matter of fact, the whole world system is constantly attempting to train us and condition us to put our life in the center of all of the conversations. But our response to the gospel puts a demand that Jesus is now at the center of all the conversations. For who are you, Lord? You're not like me. Who are you, Lord? Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. Who are you, Lord? And in the way that you've revealed yourself to me, what am I now supposed to do about it? Because I can't stay the same. But that's the whole point. You come to me because you have a desire to change me. You come to me because you know that I am not what I could be. And even in moments or unique time periods where I may be satisfied with how far you've brought me, I still understand that there's so much more for me. There's so much more in Jesus for you. There's so much more in the person of Jesus and in the revelation of Jesus for you. And I believe tonight that God longs to reveal his son in our hearts to where a fresh vision of Jesus would place the demand on each one of our lives and each one of our hearts individually. Now, this is something that only the Spirit can do. But a fresh and real vision of Jesus is going to place a demand and also place a desire in order for God to touch us in places that need to be touched, in order for us to rearrange things that need to be rearranged, in order for us to be delivered from things that we need to be delivered from. <laughs> Insecurity, fear, doubt, uh, all of these things, uh, uh, a lack of real identity that God would substantialize who we are in him by revealing himself to us. Um, and this is something that has to be by the spirit. Because there's just not enough emotion over the next couple of days to keep this train rolling. But I believe that if we would be willing to give ourselves to the presence of God tonight. That he would do what we can't do ourselves. Right? God is on mission right now. He has launched this redeemed family into the nations of the world. Right? There's a family that's on mission. We would call this the church. There's a family that's on mission. And I really believe that the Lord wants to touch us tonight. I believe it with all of my heart. And I, and I just sense, even now, that the Lord 
is inviting us to draw nigh. To come close. Right? E even as Moses did. God issued the invitation, but Moses had to climb the mountain to go meet with God. And I would love to just, for the next several moments, just give all of our attention over to the person and the presence of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you all over the room if you would stand. Because I sense something special is going to happen tonight. I sense something real special is going to happen tonight. And again, this isn't some like cheerleader verbiage. But I sense something really special is going to happen tonight. For those of us whose hearts are burning right now. Man, for those of us whose hearts are burning right now. Will you go wherever he wants you to go? Will you do whatever he wants you to do? Will you be joyfully obedient? Even unto the point of death? Even if that means the death of your own ideas, the death of your own dream, <laughs> the death of all of the desires that at times create these weird intersections and these complications, will you serve brother and betrayer even into your final moments if it means the revelation of God's Son can come crashing into the heart? of those who God may put in close proximity to you. We truly are getting ready for him. We truly are getting ready for him. But until he comes, we are readying others. We are readying others. He's coming again. He's coming again. He's coming again. This is an ultimate thing. And this ultimate thing should inform every other immediate thing. He's coming again. And his heart is broken. His reward at the end of the age is a people. This inheritance. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue. I know at times we put a demand on God to fulfill all of our dreams, and I know that I brought encouragement to that in the beginning. But let's think about it this way. Jesus has a dream, and he's been waiting thousands of years to get it. This people this bride that he thought was to die for, this inheritance from the nations. There's something that he's longing for. There's something that he hasn't gotten yet in the way that he really wants it. You and I are the reward that Jesus is after at the end of the age. And he is trying to increase that number. He is trying to bring more into the outcome or the equation. Will you partner with him? Will you join your life into his desires to harvest the nations starting right here with your neighbors? Will you allow God's compassion, his heart to alleviate the suffering of others by revealing himself to them? <laughs> I know you're broken. I know you're desperate. But here I am. I know you're bound. I know you long for freedom. But look at my son. God is satisfying all of the solutions that the world is looking for 
through the revealing of his son. <laughs> Let's just for a moment before the Lord. Let's just right now just gather all of your attention. Just for the next couple of moments, let's just begin to posture ourselves in worship.